I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak to you today briefly about my thoughts on LDC urban climate change adaptation. I'm very sorry that I'm not able to attend, but I have a horrible head cold, but I'm eager to talk about some of, the, of these ideas. Urbanization should bring about poverty reduction through the channels that urban economists celebrate of trade and learning. But in the absence of a global carbon tax, urbanization is going to contribute to global greenhouse gas production and exacerbate the risk of climate change. While I celebrate the accomplishments in Paris at the COP21, the conference did not succeed in putting a price on carbon. Thus, there's going to continue, in my opinion, to be global free riding. Greenhouse gas emissions are going to continue to grow. And I'm very concerned, as I know all of you are, that unchecked climate change raises great challenges for reducing poverty in the developing world, both in rural and urban areas. In this graph, I take World Development Indicators data and I graph this global public bad, uh, carbon dioxide emissions, with respect to time going out to the year 2009. And you see basically a linear trend here of global rising greenhouse gas emissions. And while I hope that th this curve can be bent, I'm pessimistic that it will. A consequence of increased energy consumption in the developing world will be just ever rising greenhouse gas emissions. It, perhaps not a linear trend, but not the 80% reduction that climate scientists say we need. And this is why I have continued to work on the economics of climate change adaptation. I'm a pessimist that we can bend this curve because we have not had the political will to take the Pigouvian step of putting a global price on carbon and incentivizing behavioral change and directed technological change to decarbonize the economy. A piece of good news going on around the world is our climate science is getting better and better. The climate scientists at every leading university all around the world are focusing on ever better spatial models of the risks that we have un collectively unleashed with risks for temperature, rainfall extremes, sea level rise in our coastal and river areas, and natural disaster risk. These climate scientists, like Paul Revere of the past, are generating these forecasts, and the internet, through the smartphones that you might be checking right now as I speak, the wide diffusion of cell phones throughout the developing world allow people, even in the developing world, to have easy access to this real-time information about the threats they face. And information, of course, is necessary for adaptation. A distinction, of course, needs to be made about adaptation in the developed world versus the developing world. And going back to my 2010 book, Climatopolis, I've argued and uh, have debated with many of you, uh, in the developed cities, we have much capacity to adapt to climate change. The population has already urbanized. There is a durable capital stock, some of which is in harm's way, but no capital lives forever. It's constantly depreciating, and we face choices over whether to invest it, to increase investment in it and upkeep. Cities in the developed world, there's a large middle class who have access to market goods to protect themselves from air conditioners to better diets, access to health care. We have a mature real estate and insurance industry. The insurance industry faces strong incentives out of profit maximization to send signals about risk and to price risk differentially such that those in harm's way are charged more and are incentivized to take actions to reduce their exposure to risks. In general equilibrium, Housing that is at risk from climate change will sell for a discount, and this creates incentives for homeowners who are residual claimants to be an interest group to lobby local officials to take actions to protect their areas. This can have benevolent effects of encouraging efficient investments. It can also have unintended consequences of spatial moral hazard, which I will come back to. Of course, my focus today is in the developing world where the same issues arise, but, but with many twists. The population in developing world is now urbanizing. A large rural population who always had the option to move to cities now faces risk to farming profit, 
due to increased drought risk, heat risk, and extreme rainfall. This has brought about this concept of environmental refugees on the move. As in the developed world, there are there is a middle class and there's emerging markets for real estate and insurance, but these are not thick competitive markets in the same sense as in the developed world. There's three questions that I'd like to pose to you today, and I'm working on all of these, and I'm hoping that folks at the conference, that this interests folks to stimulate discussion and debate. Three questions. One, do local leaders have an incentive to protect the urban poor against quality of life insults in the developing world? Two, what are the likely consequences of using international aid and capital to defend places rather than people? Three, through increasing the count of potential migration destinations, can the growth of new cities, Paul Romer's charter cities, facilitate adaptation? Some details. Question number one. Do local leaders in the developing world have strong incentives to protect the urban poor? A little bit of advertising. In a few months, Princeton University Press will publish my new co-authored book. And we talk about this theme <coughs> focused on air pollution. Do mayors in China have strong incentives to provide blue skies and high quality of life for their people? Or is there a continued focus just on narrow economic growth from smokestack factories? In other cities in the developing world, <coughs> a very important paper was written by Feller and Vern Henderson, centered in Brazil. Their study, which I believe needs to be studied in every developing country, investigated whether within a system of cities are mayors rewarded for being pro-poor as people as poor people move to cities what is their quality of life and henderson and feller document that mayors in brazilian cities are denying water connections to individuals because they anticipate that if they provide clean water this actually accelerates migration to their cities from a climate change adaptation standpoint, this is crucial because access to clean water is a key protection technology for reducing typhoid and infectious disease risk, and these risks are exacerbated by climate change. So again, Henderson and Feller are modeling mayors as self-interested and having a vision for their city <coughs> and recognizing that an unintended consequence of being generous with public goods is you you increase more poor people moving to that city i want us thinking about which mayors given that elastic behavioral effect if that effect is real which mayors would actively have an incentive to be nice and provide pu pro poor public goods versus who would deny these an optimistic hypothesis Many developing countries are democracies where people vote. If the poor do vote, they have an incentive to vote their own narrow self-interest. Will mayors be elected who are elected who have majority support by the poor? In terms of comparative advantage of cities, cities as bundles of industries, for those cities whose golden goose is labor-intensive industries, I would think that they have those mayors have an incentive to provide public goods and services that are pro-poor because those cities will attract more people to live there and in general equilibrium that shifts out the supply curve uh, making that city even more attractive for firms to locate there who employ low skill workers because factor prices will be low within a system of cities migrants have a have an incentive to select that city that best meets their interests and needs I'll be coming back to in a moment the key role of the menu of options in the developing world. I'm very interested in quality of life in slums in developing countries. It is my hope that as economic opportunity takes place in poor cities, that families in the slums move up the economic ladder and that their children uh, of these less educated urban manufacturers, that their children receive a better education and achieve their dreams in terms of upward mobility. This is an optimistic hypothesis. Question number two. 
much of adaptation to climate change will be about investment in hard infrastructure. How do you protect cities that can flood is an example. One obvious investment we see from the U.S. with Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans is investing in a system of seawalls. Economists are useful here in thinking about what are the unintended consequences of using money, especially national and international capital, to defend places rather than people. Leah Bustan, Paul Rohde, and I explore this in ongoing research. We posit a crowding out hypothesis. If place-based investments are perceived to make a risky area safer, such as a, a new seawall financed by the World Bank, will more people move to that area? Will they move to harm's way? To me, this is a type of spatial moral hazard in the sense that public investment in disaster mitigation displaces private self-protection. Would people move to higher ground if they didn't think that the World Bank and the national government were, was going to defend a risky place? If this elasticity is large, and I believe that it is, but this needs to be studied in country after country, I think this does affect how the World Bank should evaluate the risks and returns from place-based policies it invests in. I would hope, and I would like to speak to the World Bank's team about this issue of when projects are invested in, is the behavioral response, is the spatial behavioral response that is likely to occur, is that built into the predictive models uh, rate of return. In many cases, mayors who seek to help their geographic area to adapt to climate change don't have the resources to protect their area, especially in the developing world. A key issue that's arisen is the possibility of using municipal bonds as a source of revenue. We discuss this in our China book that more and more Chinese cities are now able to issue municipal bonds. Another way in the developing world to invest in capital to help adapt to climate change risk is land value taxation. But this requires big data on land assessments and parcels of who owns what. There have to be legal issues of identifying who owns what and what its value is and to assess it in a not, in a in a way that reflects market fundamentals. Uh, my compensating differentials training from the University of Chicago tells me that in those cities with a higher quality of life, whose quality of life is more resilient, land will be more valuable and thus uh, the same 1% tax will yield more revenue for a mayor and thus a mayor who seeks a larger tax base would be incentivized to provide climate change resilience investments in part to have a larger tax base. Self-interest for the mayor. In the United States, there's a very valuable example. David Cutler and Grant Miller studied the issue from roughly 80 years ago when American cities suffered from dirty water and that led to typhoid and diphtheria and other infectious disease and high mortality rates in our cities. They documented that the financial innovation of allowing cities to borrow in, and to issue municipal bonds allowed cities to invest in costly water treatment systems and to sharply mitigate their deaths from infectious disease. I view this as crucial of allowing cities their own sources of finance, how to use capital markets to allow cities to, to, to raise their own funds to invest in projects they want to do to reduce their exposure to climate change risk. And in a diverse world, different cities will make different choices here, but opening up this freedom gives them the choice. My final question. Question number three. Can the growth of new cities facilitate climate change adaptation? Many are trained in Tibu sorting of having a menu of communities or cities for migrants to choose from and then allowing people to be free to choose to move to that area where they want to move. I view a nation that has a system of cities, United States has roughly 300 cities, as offering a type of insurance. If any one city's quality of life goes to hell, there are other cities to choose from and the population is insured. Paul Romer's charter cities concept is crucial here. Brandon Fuller and I explore this in a short piece we wrote a couple of years ago 
called Climate Adaptation Through Migration, The Role for Charter Cities. If new cities in the developing world <coughs> could be created at relatively low cost and geographically spread out, people would be free to choose to move to those areas that best meet their needs and to have a competition among these cities. Issues would arise of who pays for these cities, but maybe there is a role for the World Bank in international funding to pay for this. This would be a type of major field experiment to fill in the product space, to offer more varieties of cities. Of course, this would take a developing country with a fair bit of land to do this. But then to have this competition across cities to see which turn out to be the most resilient. And in those geographic areas, in the face of emerging climate risk, let them grow. So as I think ahead to the year 2040, and think ahead to increasingly urbanized countries in the developing world, I look at Vern Henderson's World Cities data set, and I see that Bangladesh has 31 cities in his data set, Vietnam has 25 cities. Are these enough cities in these major nations, given the likely urbanization population in these nations in the year 2040, to accommodate all these people who want to be in cities? Or do these nations need more cities? If they need more cities, does demand create supply? Or is there capital financing issues and limitations to having entry of new cities? Industrial organization economists study the entry of new product varieties. But when do we get a new city? I'd love to see the World Bank's team in its work on resilience working on that issue. Some suggestions, and I'm almost done, for World Bank data collection. As a microeconomist, I would love to see more panel data sets of taking tens of thousands of rural people in the developing world chosen at random and then to follow them over time using a longitudinal panel research design to study do they remain in the countryside as shocks occur to rainfall and drought do they die where do they move if they move to a city what city what is their income in that city to do a survey of the durable goods they own. Do they own an air conditioner? Do they have access to electricity? How often are they sick? What is the air pollution where they live? Of much more data at the micro level, building on Angus Deaton's recent Nobel Prize, on the distributional effects of climate change. We almost have too many macro studies of how poor countries' GNP is affected by climate shocks. Deaton has taught us that we need to be investigating how individuals are affected by such shocks. If they have coping mechanisms, then we will see less sickness, we'll see less income impacts than if they're passive victims who do not have adaptation strategies to help them. Conclusion. The system of cities from urban economics is a model of city size distributions and city industrial specialization. One of my themes today has been that cities are differentiated products. San Francisco is not Pittsburgh. London is not Manchester. Another attribute of a city is its safety and resilience. And this becomes even more important in the face of climate change, of low probability, high impact events. Migration across a system of cities is a strategy for self-protection. We need competition and a diversity of cities within LDC nations to help the new urbanites to adapt. Which nations have a large enough menu of cities to choose from? What is the fixed cost of creating a new semi-durable city? What are the different public financing tools to allow individuals to protect themselves? How do we foster city competition for jobs and people? In such a competition, the rural poor would not be viewed as a liability. They, they would actually be an asset for those cities who want to attract labor-intensive industries, they need to attract laborers to work in that industry. And that incentivizes mayors to recruit and to be kind to these individuals. This is a possible vision for how we will adapt to this risk of climate change that we have collectively unleashed. Thank you very much.